My um, topic is Murray Rothbard's contribution to Austrian monetary theory. And uh, when, when Rothbard started his career uh, as an economist, um, Austrian monetary theory was really in the state that it was left by, by Mises uh, in 1912. Okay? Uh, in his Human Action, which was published in 1949, uh, Mises uh, formalized and elaborated his integration between theory of money and theory of prices. But mon his monetary theory pretty much stayed the same. Um, one addition to it occurred in 1937. Um, Frederick Hayek wrote a great book called Monetary Nationalism and International Stability, uh, in which he um, more or less formulated uh, in, 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 and elaborated the monetary adjustment process, both nationally and internationally. So there was some, there was some development, but, but again, it, it, it was really pretty much a Misesian monetary theory. But in the early 60s, uh, Rothbard wrote um, Man, Economy, and State. He also wrote a, a little book that came out in 1963, a booklet, a primer on, on, on Austrian monetary theory called What Has Government Done to Our Money? And the book America's Great Depression. All in the space of two years, they, they were published in 62, 63. And in those works, he greatly extended um, Austrian monetary theory and made uh, important contributions to it. In fact, and this I really just struck me in the last week or two when I was looking again at it, he really transformed Austrian monetary theory into a theory of money, or from a theory of money, to a theory of money prices, okay, in which you have the complete and final integration of the money and goods side, in which you have relative prices and the value of money uh, as being two sides of the same coin. Okay, I think it's very important. Um, we won't be able to get into that. Uh, um, in much detail because it's a little bit technical, but um, I think that that is really uh, the consummation of his contribution. But let me just talk about some of the things that he did do, um, less technical things. For example, he um, Mises developed what was called a taxonomy of, of money. Mises said there's three and only three kinds of money that are possible. One is a commodity money. Uh, the second is what Mises called the credit money, which people forget about today. They don't talk about much. And the third was fiat money. Um, a commodity money um, was a useful commodity, such as gold or silver, which served as a medium of exchange. Okay? And how this came about, and the fact that only commodity could first originate as money, was explained by Carl Menger. Mises then added a regression theorem, which showed that, logically, only commodities could originally serve as money. Now, what was um, credit money? Credit money, um, Mises pointed out, came into existence when a government or a fractional reserve bank reneged on its promise to redeem its notes and deposits at par, on demand. Okay. Now, what that means, for, let me give an example. In, 18, uh, in 1797, the Bank of England um, stopped redeeming pound notes in, in gold. Okay. And other banks, country banks, are permitted to suspend what's called suspending specie payments. Okay. From and, that, and, and as a result, of, as the uh, Napoleonic the Wars went on, England continued that suspension, which was originally supposed to last for six months. Okay, we've heard that before. And that went on until 1821. But during that time, the value of the English pound was not just determined by its supply and demand, as maybe pointed out. It was also determined by the expectation of the timing of the return to gold. Okay, so the second influence, it wasn't simply supply and demand. This is credit money, according to Mises. Another example was, um, in Mises' view, when the U.S. suspended uh, um, payment of gold uh, in 1933, um, and especially after World War II, Mises believed there was an expectation among the American people that eventually the dollar would be rendered convertible again. Okay. Finally, Mises, and these are also a student of Menger, pointed out that fiat money was possible. That is, a money that was completely untied to a commodity. Okay? That it was theoretically possible, and that it was consistent with, with Menger's story of the origination of money. However, what's very interesting is that um, even as late as the publication of the third edition of Human Action in 1966, Mises 
was reluctant to say that there has been any actual episode, historical episode, of fiat money. Okay, he, um, let me just read you one passage from Human Action. He said, It is not a task of catalactic, meaning economics, but of economic history to investigate whether there appeared in the past specimens of fiat money, or whether all sorts of money, which were not commodity money, were credit money. The only thing that catalactic has to establish is that the possibility of the existence of fiat money must be admitted. So even in 1966, Mises, remember the gold, the dollar was still linked to gold through the Bretton Woods system, Mises was not convinced that the American people um, didn't foresee at some point in the future uh, the return to gold, and that that expectation influenced the value of the dollar, but that the dollar was still credit money. It really took Rothbard in what is government done to our money to explain uh, using what I call a praxeological historical theorem. Okay, and I'll call it the degression theorem. Okay, that is money degressing from the, co the commodity money to, to um, is it falling from from the peak of commodity money to something else, to something totally different, to something that's different in kind, a fiat money. Uh, and what Rothbard did was he used uh, pretty much the American the American experience. Um, and he showed that um, there were a series of steps that caused people to, who were conditioned to accept commodity as money to eventually accept a pure name. Remember, it's all fiat money. It's a pure name. The, the government could put, the, could put it on this book, could put $1,000 on this book, could stamp it on, on a shirt, and that would serve. If people were convinced that that was, that was uh, legitimately stamped, it would circulate as money. So the dollar was whatever the government said it was, okay, it was a pure name. Not its value, but, but the thing that was, was the concrete thing that, that uh, represented the dollar. And Ross Ward went through, and I won't go through this, but you should, I do rec highly recommend what is government done for money. Uh, he, he showed the steps by which this occurred, this deconditioning. Um, there was the monopoly of the mint, uh, in which only, only, only the government, it was the fraud of the government to mint coins. Um, and then eventually they substituted um, a brand name for standard weight instead of ounces and grains of gold. You had dollars and so on. That is, some king would, would take the coin and um, let's say King Nitwit, and he put a picture on there and he called one nit. And eventually, and initially, one nit was equal to one ounce. But then he debased the coin. Okay, as he recoined them because they, they became worn, or as he pulled them back, he would shave them and he would debase them or, or adulterate them with fake metal. Okay, and eventually people kept calling them one nick. So they became used to the name. Okay? And Rockford points that out. Uh, then eventually they encouraged the substitution of banknotes and deposits for gold and silver circulation when banknotes came into existence. Um, they permitted banks, then when, bank, when these fractional reserve banks got into trouble to suspend specie payments, so then people were then operating for a few months or a year with credit money. They were operating with, they began to look on the piece of paper as the money and not the goal, to which it was really a, a property title. Um, they uh, setting up a central bank was another step in this process. The institution of the gold bullion and gold exchange standard in which you could no longer convert the, um, the dollar or the pound or the franc into coins. Um, only uh, large users of, of money, for example, in international trade, you get a um, they would only allow you to convert large sums of, of let's say, dollars for a big bar of gold bullion. Uh, government insurance, which uh, propped up um, uh, uh, people's confidence in banks when, when they began to fail in the 1930s. And then finally, going off the gold standard during the war, um, acclimated people further, further to, um, to fiat, to, uh, to, to the name as the money. Okay? And eventually, in 1971, when Nixon closed the gold window, he had pure fiat money. So Rothbard explains this step by step. And this was not done in Mises, okay? Uh, and as I said, Mises was even um, reluctant to admit that fiat money had actually existed, uh, ever, okay? There had been any historical episode. Um, a second, uh, I think, important contribution of Rothbard was um, improving on Mises' definition statistical definition of the money supply. Okay, Mises defined the um, money properly, I think, as a general medium of exchange. Um, and he was one of the first economists to include not just paper currency notes, but also bank checking accounts or demand deposits in the money supply. Mises did this in his book in 1912, 
1911, the uh, famous American monetary theorist, uh, Irving Fisher, and then later on, the famous British monetary theorist, A.C. Pigou, neither of them included command deposits of checking account money on a par with currency. Okay. But uh, Mises, unfortunately, did not include savings deposits. Okay. Despite the fact, if you look at human action, Mises points out that um, he blamed savings deposits for a lot of the problems that occurred, or the financial crises that occurred uh, in the early 1930s. He points out that savings deposits, despite the fact that there was always a, a, a notice that you had to give in order to convert them, uh, in the U.S. it was a 30-day notice, despite the fact that they were technically then time deposits, um, that banks, in order to attract capital from abroad, allowed the depositors to take them out at any point, convert them at any point. So Mises said that the savings deposits that they could be immediately redeemed um, brought about the phenomenon of what was called hot money flight or capital flight. The that they were pulled out of, of, of different countries during the early 1930s and caused the banks to collapse. So Mises recognized all this, um, that in effect, people looked on savings deposits as they as readily spendable dollars, just as they did with currency and with checking account money. However, in human action, Mises does not include savings deposits as part of the money supply. He includes them or discusses them in a separate section called secondary media of exchange. And uh, he um, includes along with them government bonds and blue chip stocks. In other words, he sees them as a non money that is extremely liquid to him. It was a lot part of contribution. In um, America's Great Depression, Rothbard used the Mengerian definition of supply, that is Paul Menger's definition of supply. Now, for Paul Menger and, and, and for Paul Bauer, supply was composed of things, they could be physically different, that were equally serviceable for a human want, or that were interchangeable in serving a human want. Okay? If people see, see no difference between delicious apples and Macintosh apples, okay, then for so that person, they own some Macintosh apples, some delicious apples. Those are the same good. Other people might think differences up there, okay? And so that the, they would not be part of the same supply. So Rothbard then came up with a criterion called the interchangeability criterion. And what he said there was that since savings deposits are immediately redeemable at par, okay, on demand, instantaneously redeemable on, on, on demand at par, um, they are part of the money supply. And being a, a, a great scholar, he went back and he found an article by an obscure American economist, Lynn Lynn, okay, must be a Chinese extractor, uh, who uh, it appeared in 1937 in the ADR, I, the name escapes me right now, in which um, Lynn Lynn argued in, in, in detail that savings deposits were, were, were um, dollar for dollar interchangeable with demand deposits. So Rothbard then expanded the... Um, definition of the money supply to include not just currency and demand deposits that Mises had, but all savings deposits. And he, and he went beyond that and pointed out that, look, even government bonds, uh, the series E savings bonds, uh, are, after six months, despite the fact that the maturity date might be nine years in the future, seven years in the future, can be redeemed at par um, at a bank or at the treasury, um, dollar for dollar, and therefore, he included those also. So this was another, I think, step forward in um, what the monetary theory. Uh, okay. Um, one other contribution, and there's, there's numerous contributions, and um, I'm not quite finished with the paper, but I'll, I'll send it to those who want it via um, an attachment on email. But Rothbard. Um, in 1982, he wrote, he wrote a book called The Mystery of Banking. Okay, now, this is, is a little bit later of, of than the um, other contributions that came in the early 1960s. But what he did was to integrate the money the uh, multiplier expansion, deposit expansion multiplier, excuse me, um, into Austrian monetary theory. Okay? It was in 1920 that an economist named C.A. Phillips, an American economist, um, showed that Every dollar of reserve in a fractional bank system can be multiplied, okay? And that the multiplier depended on 
the reserve ratio that the central bank set, or the reserve ratio if there's no central bank regulation setting that reserve ratio, reserve ratio that was conventionally held by banks. And he set up a simple equation, said that the amount of demand deposits, checking account money in the economy, is equal to the amount of reserve, capital off the reserve, times one divided by the reserve ratio, determined by the central bank or determined uh, by the banks themselves. And this was accepted before World War II. It became accepted by most economists. But after World War II, and especially after Friedman and Schwartz wrote, <laughs> what they did was they came up with a fancier and seemingly more sophisticated money multiplier. And the money multiplier was an attempt... Remember, money is equal to M for money is equal to the amount of currency plus the amount of demand deposits, representing all, 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 all deposits that are immediately redeemable. <coughs> um, what they did was they set up a fancier one. <coughs> CR represents the amount of currency, the currency ratio, the currency that people want to hold uh, as a proportion of, of the um, deposits they hold, okay? Plus, or uh, divided by CR plus RR. But this ratio, that is the currency deposit ratio that, Amer- that, that, that the, the public holds, is determined by the public, okay? It's not determined by the central bank. So Rothbard saw that this mixed two separate influences on the money supply. Remember, in the 1930s, it was the public that rushed to take currency out of the banks. Now, when they took the currency out of the banks, that reduced the amount of reserves in the banking system which then reduced the amount of demand deposits. They went down, and that caused the money supply to go down. However, at the same time, the Fed was pushing up its control reserves, the reserves that it controlled. It was creating new reserves to try to offset the public-induced reduction of, of checking account money and therefore the money supply. Now, they ultimately failed in this endeavor. Okay? That is, the Fed did not increase reserves enough to offset the withdrawal of currency that was decreasing reserves for the, uh, by the public. <coughs> well, to make a long story short, this is what allowed Rothbard to point out that the Fed was in fact inflationary. Even though the money supply wasn't increasing, the reserves controlled by the Fed was increasing. Now, along comes Friedman and Schwartz, and what they do is they have this multiplier here, which is multiplied times the monetary base, monetary base being the amount of currency in the system plus the amount of bank reserves. And they say, well, look, the Fed controls the monetary base, and, and, and the Fed, in some sense, having um, inflated both the public and the Fed's influences on um, this money multiplier, the Fed controls all of this, okay? Therefore, if the money supply is falling, the Fed must have been deflationary, okay? Now, what Rockford did in 1982 was to reestablish the old Phillips, the correct, simpler Phillips multiplier, okay? which can be used both to show what's happening when the public withdraws, reduces reserves by withdrawing currency, on the one hand, and on the other hand, what happens with when the Fed increases reserves. Okay? So there's two different influences on the money supply. The public and the Fed. Okay? The Fed was inflationary. The public was deflationary by pulling currency out and causing a contraction of demand deposits. Right? So... Um, Rothbard when he, uh, was, was criticized. I had a, an exchange with um, a monetarist about two or three years ago in um, Ideas on Liberty, uh, uh, Richard Timberlake, in which um, we discussed these, these issues. Okay. So bottom line is that um, I think uh, what people forget about the, the mystery of banking, um, this was uh, reviewed by Larry White, um, and I was disappointed to see that when I went back and read this, that he completely missed Rothbard's reinst- re- re- restoration of the correct original Phillips multiplier. Okay. okay I'll stop here. And take All right. Thanks very much.